I mean, everyone started with a little bit of it himself. So um, I started programming when I was 25. That's around seven years ago. And with R, I started like two years ago. And quickly, I, oh, I, I, I went to R because of ggplot. And since one year, I know about Dideverse. So yeah. Uh, I linked the link to the presentation. So if you want to, you can uh, jump to it before me. Um, I don't know if it's interesting for you guys, but I also have a small CV if you're interested what I did before. So I'm no professional programmer. I just did that stuff for fun. Okay, let's get started uh, about object-oriented programming. Uh, in short, OOB. So if you are familiar with this concept from other programming languages, at least that what we are now talking now has nothing to do with OOB like in other programming languages. So if you hope you learn here something about Python, or it will help you in Python, it does not really. So R OOB is a little bit different. Uh, just get started in the so in the next few weeks we're talking about three types of OOB in R. There are actually more, but um, for the end use of us only these three are of interest, and that's S3, which you should use as it is all already included in the base R package. Then R6 which I had a short glimpse in it, and it looks a lot more like OOB I know. And S4, which is used by Bioconductor, so that's also very interesting, especially if you do some gen genetic stuff where our Bioconductor is really big. Overall, um, the, the book talks about two main paradigms, and the first is encapsulated, and the second is functional. So the difference, what you see here is simply that in the encapsulated, you see here first an object and then a me method called. So the methods are, are encapsulated with the objects. That's, that's how I know OOP works. And for me, that's a lot cleaner. But in R and the S3 is a generic and that's functional OOP. And for me, Functional OOP, I really don't like the, the name of it. In, in my opinion, it should call it multiple dispatch uh, because the methods no longer belongs to a class. Um, where, where this functional OOP comes from is from how S4 method works from Ch John Chambers and also hardly references to him. So I, I mean, I'm no native English speaker, but functional OOP is a really strange concept for me. Um, I have a question. Yeah. So going back to the previous slide. Yeah. So you're saying um, the OOP um, has two paradigms, right? Um, yeah. Encapsulated and functional. So R is functional OOP only? Uh, there, is, there is three. Sorry? The S3 is functional OOP. But the, the other ones, so the uh, R6 and S4, mm -hmm. are not functional OOP. Uh, they are encapsulated OOP. Yeah, yeah. Or, or a little bit more. It's, it's, it's still not a strict OOP, but yeah. Um, so um, I'm, I'm still confused. When you say um, encapsulated OOP and functional OOP, can you explain again? Uh, it, it, it probably makes more sense when, when we go to the example. Okay. So mm -hmm. yeah. just give it the time. This is for SCE, this one, one can ask this one, the first one. Uh, it, it can dispatch on multiple parameters. So yeah. Uh, but just, just as example, how it works, and that's how multiple dispatch works, and that's how R. I mean, it, it works a lot more sophisticated, but that's how it works. So here I write a function. Simply, uh, it takes the data and, and have a signature. And then R, you have to think about the signature 
is the class name. So based on the class name, this function does two different things. So here have a simply switch statement and uh, for character and number, it does two different things. If we use this function, for example, for a character with the signature char, it gives us the length of the um, character. If we use the same function for uh, a vector of numbers and give the signature number, it will give us the sum. So this, this process of finding the correct uh, function for your signature is called method dispatch. Okay. And here, here again, like he, that's a quote from him, functional OB, this is called functional because from the outside, it looks like a regular function call and internally the components are also functions. And then, okay, then it's no OOB anymore. For me, that's like, a simple function. Um, like I said, it's a, a little bit more sophisticated than R. And the problem when you look at that code is that no one else would be able to add some new methods. And in R, you can add, add new methods, but we will see. Um, I have a question. Yeah. So um, looking at this function. Yeah. Um, inside the functions are all um, functions as well, right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And the way in which we select the right function to work on is called method dispatch. Yeah, Am exactly. Right? Uh, okay, so this whole concept is called functional OOP, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. I got you. Is, uh, sorry, is method dispatch always a switch statement? Can it be like a... No, else? no, no. That's, that's, that's my, my base example in, in R. It's, in R, it's very, very, a lot more sophisticated. So it's, it's also the base um, implement, implemented stuff is written in C with a, with a switch statement, but all other things are written uh, with a generic function and we come to this. So, so. The, the big advantage of the generic function is that you as developer can add new switch statements, so, so to say. Um, yeah. So, um, I mean, the, this function doesn't look like normal function in R. Okay, so um, it is not normal function because we add signature, right? What what distinguish uh, this function from switch? the normal function? That no, no. Swi switch is a base base R function. What you do? No, the whole MDE. That's um, a, yeah. That's what, that's a simple yeah. function. Yeah. Yeah. So what distinguish this one from normal? Base R function. Nothing. Nothing. So, so Hannes, I, I just yeah. want to be clear. So, this this uh, function that you have here is just an example of how yeah. that works, not actually how it. How it no, works. no. Yeah, yeah. So that that's what I have written, just to how how it would work under the hood. Okay. Okay. So this is basically normal function as we know. There is nothing. Um, it what makes it exceptional to be called functional here? Um, uh, like, like I said, it, it makes a lot more sense when you come to the uh, <laughs> examples when it's uh, how it really works. But that should just show that basically the method dispatch searches by a signature and the signature mm -hmm. is the class name in, in, mm -hmm. in normal okay. cases. Mm -hmm. And then based on the signature, it calls different functions. Okay. And that's okay. on the next slide, um, that's called polymorphism. Okay. So the use of the same function form for different types of inputs. Right. Okay? Yes. And the whole thing, again, makes more, more sense with a base example. Mm -hmm. So we have here the, the cut type of column of diamonds. It's an ordered factor, okay? Mm -hmm. If I use the summary function, it gives us the counts of each factor, okay? Now, 
if we use the karat column, which, which is a number vector, it gives us minimum media mean. Okay. So, uh -huh. so the same, the same, the base, same function gives you different output based on the input. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how, how summary knows that it needs to do different outputs is based on the class. And, and this one has the class of ordered factor. And this one has the class of numeric. Okay. And overall, that's, that's how, how R works. And it's kind of good. And I, 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 I'm not against it. But I think that's quite um, unclean, unclean solution. Because you actually, you don't know how the output looks. If you, so it's not always the same output and it's up to discussion if that's good or bad. I, I think it's not always good, especially as programmer. If I think I, I get always the same output when I'm writing tests or something here, I get different outputs based on the input. Yeah. Question. Yeah. So yeah, summary, best summary here is S3. What, what's that? The summary, yeah. is it, the summary object, is it S3 object? The summary is a yes. function. Is S3? No, uh, this is S3. Or oh, that's not, that's that's all base. But um, how, how should I explain it? Also the base, the, the, the base um, objects have a class. Mm -hmm. So not only, um, as free objects and all other have a class, also the base have actually a class. And the summary is a, is a generic base function. And generic functions, we will see in the next uh, few slides, have different methods to dispatch. But let's go to the next example. Um, yeah, that's we don't need. Uh, okay, so OOP, What's the good thing is it allows us to extend, for example, the summary function for new types. So we could write a new type. And if we use the summary function, it gives a different output. That would be not possible if we use a if else or a switch statement, like in my example. So mm -hmm. you, cannot, you cannot add it if you don't have access to the um, code base. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I talked about class and method. So actually when I talk about methods that just describes what an object of class can do, but we don't need that. Uh, the last part about object like, um, okay, but I, I will read it, thanks. So Julia, I think is the same, yeah. Julia does also use uh, multiple dispatch. Um, so another, reason why you should use classes is it's hierarchical. So for people who don't know how that works, that's in, that's one thing which is in every programming language more or less the same. You have a base class, for example, here animal, and then you have subclasses which, which inherits animal. So if you look at the animal, it has here a move method and the dog also have a move method. Now, when I call animal.move, and call this, that's a different move than the dog.move. But the eat method here in the animal is not available in the dog. That means if I call dog.eat, it will call the animal.eat. So that's inherited. Uh, as example, how that works in R, uh, ordered factor inherits, for example, from regular factor. And generalized linear model, models inherit from linear model. We, we will do an example on linear model and then the whole thing makes a lot more sense. But if you read this with the generalized linear model, you will see that it's, it's a lot of less, a uh, lot less redundant code. So you write a lot less code if you do uh, object oriented programming. Um, of course, like I'm, always fascinated there's a package to check how stuff like uh, the method dispatch works and helps you with the S3 objects. 
So that's the S loop package. And if you use the O type, it tells you what object type it is. And if I give it a simple vector, it says it's base. If I give it, for example, this sample data set, empty cast, it says S3. Because a data frame is actually an S3 and it's based on a list uh, and has the class data frame. And then uh, for an example symbol for S4, that's just a stats um, function. And then the object is S4, but yeah. Um, um, Anas, I, what's the difference yeah. between a, a, a base, um, a base will, object and, a, um, and an S3? Yeah, S3 we will see it in the next examples, but the difference is that if I look at the vector and try to access the class, it says not there is no class and they have a class. Uh, they still have a class actually, but you cannot access, access the attribute that easy. Um, but so the, the thing is the base are written in, in C and they are the, the other things are based on a base type and then further enhanced. So that's, that's more or less, but we will see in the example. Um, yeah, here is the discussion. So if I look at the class attribute of the base type for an integer here, it says null. But if I call class and the integer, it tells me integer. Now the thing is that's still misleading because if I use the S loop package and say S3 class, it tells me integer and numeric. And that's actually, so with the integer and numeric, that's actually how the method dispatch works. So if I, if I use the uh, integer into a generic function, it will first look, is there a function for integer and then for numeric. But we will see again in an example. Um, so uh, I, this slide, so each, each one has also, a, that's the base. Of this thing. Adrian, you are a little bit noisy. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so each each one has also a base type. So like I said, the data frame has the base type of list. And when, when I look at the class, it says data frame. So data frame is actually a class, for example. And base types like the list or the integer are written in C and use the switch statements. So we cannot uh, change it. Uh, yeah, we don't need that stuff, but um, yeah, generic functions. So there are generic functions. We will work, work with some examples, but there are also some primitive functions and they are hard if you want to extend it or edit it. Because when you write generic function of plus, as we know from a previous chapter, it's actually a function with two input elements from, so. And it's, it's, it's in blend, uh, it's, it's belongs to a group of arithmetic operations. So the arithmetic operations are all in, written in C. So if we change one of these arithmetic operations, we change everything. So you can't, cannot change it from the outside. It's, it's not, that um, important, but just note that there are really primitive functions which you cannot edit the single elements. You can also always look which methods are inside this function. So if I look at the uh, show methods of the plus symbol, we see, okay, there's one, one, one method for uh, where the first input is date, then a duration or date, then a period a diff time and duration, et cetera, et cetera. And that list is really long. So there are a few hundred methods just by this plus symbol. Um, okay. So that, that was actually the, the first part. That's the second part. And now it will make a lot more sense. So if, if you're now feeling like, okay, I don't know what's happening don't care about it. Now with the S3 chapter, the whole concept 
makes more sense. So we talked about this, a, a base, um, so a factor, I create here a factor. And if I look at the base type, it says it's an integer. So we all know factors are actually numbers. And if you look at the attributes, it gives us levels and the class of factor. So actually a factor is already a three class, you could say, okay. Uh, yeah, that's we talked about it. Okay, here's, here's again an example of generic function. So the SDR function, if we use this loop package with F type, it tells you S3 and generic. So it tells you it's a, it's a generic function and it takes S3 objects. We create a time and use the SDR function. It will give us that output with a correct format, et cetera, et cetera. If we remove the class that it's, it's the base type, we see that actually the time element is a list and we get that output. So the whole thing here is that um, the time is a S3 object based on a list. And the list here is thrown together to give you the correct output format. To see this in action, there's a S3 dispatch function. Again, in the S loop package. And if, you, if we catch the whole thing inside this S3 dispatch, we see what I was meant with the switch statement. So the SDR function looks, okay, where is the SDR.bosx uh, method? If it finds it, it will take that. If, it's, if it will not find a method for this class, it will take the default one. But you see here the arrowhead, that means it found it and it will use that output. You could actually call that sdr.posx by hand. So we, we can simply call that function manually, but you should not do that because that's sometimes problematic if you give it an input which is really not for that stuff. <clears throat> okay. Now let's create a simple S3 class. That's, that, that was one of my simplest examples what I could think of. You give your object a structure and it must have a class attribute. And in my, in my case, it's the class is called animal. So if I create this object and I check, okay, it has the class animal, it inherits the animal class, yes, true, okay. That means in R, S3 class is simply defined by the class name. Now the crazy thing is, again, like in functions, you could change classes of a already defined object. For example, we have to find our F object. That was a factor. We could say, okay, class, change it to date. If you do this and print the F object, it gives you the base dates plus one from the integer. So that that's, you, you could, for example, uh, if you have a data frame, you could write class integer and something would happen. I don't know what would happen, but something would happen. So you can edit classes of already defined objects. And that's not possible in other languages. So, so R lets you complete freedom. Even the defining of classes, it's really simple and you don't have to follow any structure. The only thing you need is a class attribute. To put, um, hardly, gives you some good practices how you should create classes because like I said, I don't care how you do it. So he, he gives um, examples and we, we're doing here one example. For example, we, we do a new taxa. So that's the constructor, uh, constructor. The constructor, you should start with a new underline and then your class name. 
uh, it's again a simple function with some base uh, evaluation and then the structure as in the example before and it now has two attributes so it has the class attribute of taxa and an uh, additional attribute of kingdom now we can use this function to create um, a new object and the, with the value of dog and if we print it we see we have now a dog object with the attribute of class of taxa and the kingdom of animalia in he also talks about the constructor it's safe because you should program it that only you use it as developer if you if you also um want the user inputs to be validated you should use a validate function and for that's simply for for, for performance reasons so this one you should do the same but now with validate underline and then taxa and then again a function and here i simply check um, if the uh, input values are unique that a similar thing happens when you create a factor because a factor cannot have two same level classes um, okay to to connect everything there's the helper and the helper now is for the end user. The helper, what, what it does is it calls the constructor and validates the input. And it gives a user-friendly error me message. So the helpers are actually for the end user. And that's what you will encounter. So if you call new factor or a state or something, it will use a helper more or less. And in our example, the helper would look like something like this. Uh, the helper should be uh, named like the class name. So I, I name it Daxa. Uh, I, I trim here white space, nothing special. And then I call validate Daxa that we predefined and then new Daxa. So I construct the Daxa and then I validate it. And now I create an object with uh, dog and cat with the class, uh, with the kingdom of Animalia. And if I look at the attributes, it gives me a class taxa, kingdom, animalia. Okay, that was now a lot, but you, you may now think why you need all that stuff. I said in the first presentation, the linear model is a good example because there is a lot of inputs happening. If you create a linear model, and if you look at the output, there's a lot uh, uh, there's a lot saved in it. Uh, there's a lot of uh, input. Uh, if you look at the base type of this, that's again a list. So that's an S3 object of type list. And all the elements here are lists, more or less, or are list attributes. Um, you can also check that this list elements have different types of. Um, Base types. So actually, there's like the QR that's again a list, or the model is again a list. So you have a lot of going on in there. If you would write this yourself, it would look something like this. So you have the same thing going on with some input checks, and then your structure, and then your list, and then your values. And that's where I said, uh, GLM, the generalized linear model, is based on a linear model. If you want now a, a little bit different object, but most of the stuff is the same, you can simply say, okay, that's a linear model, but I want to extend it with a few uh, names or uh, list attributes. And that's where OOP is great because you can simply extend that stuff a little bit. Okay. Generic functions, I, I often talked, but I never said what's generic functions. And, and um, if you look, you, you all probably have looked at the uh, source code of some functions. And if you look at the source code, it tells you something like function, use method, print. And then you think like, yeah, what tells you that? Nothing. That's how you declare a generic function, exactly like this. 
And with the dispatch, you see that it's working like a generic function because if I give uh, the print function uh, system date, it will print print dot date. So the dot date is actually the class. And if you want to look at all the generic functions, what print has, have, um, it has 321 different generic functions. So there are 321 different outputs or inputs. And now the cool stuff is you can extend it by yourself. So you could write your own generic functions or extend uh, already defined ones. First, we will write our own generic function. And like I said, the only thing to do for a generic function, and that's not a switch statement now, you have to write it like this. So you write a function, in my case, print animal, and inside the function, you call the function with use method. And if you have written that, it's already a generic function. And R knows, okay, print animal is a generic function. You can define a default value by simply adding a dot default. So every time it encounters a class name, which there is no method defined, it will call the default. And now I extend it also with a DAXA, dot DAXA. So if it encounters a class name of DAXA, it will output me the DAXA. So if I now print animal my bats, I get the output dog and cat because it found that. If I print um, an integer, it says no specific method defined. So because it's used the default one. We can look why or how the dispatch works by with the S loop package with S3 dispatch. And now it looks, okay, it first looks, is there a print animal dot double? No. Is there a print animal dot numeric? No. Okay, take the print animal dot default. So it will check all the classes of the number. And if it finds nothing, it will use the default one. That's the same example. We don't need to talk about it. Uh, okay, inheritance. <clears throat> First of all, I don't want print taxa. I want to use the normal print function. And to extend the normal print function, you simply have to write print dot your class name, and it already works. Inside here, I define how I want the output, output to be happening. Um, now I look with the S3 dispatch when I print my bets object, it says, okay, use print dot taxa. If I, un if I use this function, it, the normal, the base print function now gives me your taxa dog cat belongs to kingdom of animalia. So I extended a base generic function to use my class name. There's one downside, which is talked in, in the chapter. Um, if we subset a class, which we gener generated, it will, it will lose the class attribute. So to, the workaround is that you have to define for the subsetting, so for the brackets, your, your, um, the input with your constructor. And the next method here, there's also a, a base R thing. It will simply tell, tell the function, okay, use the next method, but then use new DAXA. So actually it will, it will subset with the default function, but then call the new DAXA constructor. If we do that workaround, it, it works again with subset. So that's a, a dirty workaround because that's not, it's not working always. And of course there's a package which does that for you. And it's in the last slide, I think, but I didn't look at the package so far. Okay, the last thing, 
we will talk is a subclass. Um, if you want that your class supports also uh, subclasses, you have to add a few things to your uh, constructor. The first thing is that dot, dot, dot. The dot, dot, dot is needed that your function takes any amount of input. The second thing, it needs a class, ar a class argument and that, that can be empty for the constructor. Because in the structure, you add the dot, dot, dot here and your class is now a, a vector with class and your base, um, your parent class name. So why, why does this work? If you call the constructor like this, it will simply ignore the dot, dot, dot. And if the first value of your class is empty, it will ignore this and only use taxa. Now we can extend it with a child, the parent, and here I call it new science. And what that the child class does is simply calling, uh, simply adding one new parameter, and that's the Latin name. And inside the function, I call the base, the parent constructor with the Latin attribute and the class of science. So I create this object now with a Latin name. And if I look again at the dispatch of the print, it will use again the print taxa because when I look at the classes of doc science, it now has science and taxa. And because it didn't found any method for science, it will use the taxa. So that's a really good way and quick way to extend your classes. Of course, we could again define a print.science. So for our science class, and here I define some HTML code. So now when I print my doc.science, I get that output. So I get the name, I get the species, the Latin name, and I get my kingdom. That's the package I talked. It's the VCDRS package. If you use this as tool for class generation, you don't need to care about the subsetting because it, it, will you, it makes it more or less standard. The, real, the last part is dispatch the details. We don't talk about it because that's um, really, really, if you're interested into it, but I think it's just too much and really not that helpful to understand the whole concept. So I know that was a quick rundown, but I think the examples at the end did help to understand it, hopefully. I hope I wasn't too fast with the whole thing. So any questions, sorry. Um, yeah. good ride. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like I said at the beginning, if, if you are, that has actually not a lot to do with option, uh, object oriented programming. That's mm. S3, that's really like its own thing. It's, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's object orientation, but it's just a very different, you know, idea of how everything fits together. Like, I didn't even know R was object oriented until a couple of years ago. Yeah. It, it's kind of nice if somebody who's just starting using it for data science, that you don't need to worry about that. And one thing I've always, I, I love the, how simple the OOP stuff in Python is, but one thing I've always disliked about it is that it's not consistent. Mm -hmm. um, so things like uh, len is, a, is just a function. I mean, presumably yeah. it's a method of something, but you, you find the length of an object by saying length parentheses, object name parentheses, instead of object.len. So yeah, it can but be Using. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but but it makes for me it makes a lot more sense when I write object dot length because I know okay that ob object has this length method. If 
if I do stuff like this, I, 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 I generate a generic function for print. It's, it's in, my, in my head, it's floating somewhere in the space, but no one knows about it, you know? Yeah, it's using o OOP as a tool for, for development, for like developing packages and things like that, not as a tool for users to organize their things. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. So from the end user's perspective, it will sound somehow difficult, right? Yeah. Mm. It depends, but as I said, if if you are if you know that you get different output for the same mm -hmm. function, it's mm -hmm. okay. If you yeah. don't know it, it's yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, like the the reason why summary gives you know a nicely formatted thing for whatever you try to summarize is is magic to a new R user, and it's actually object orientation. Yeah, and it's magic in every other language because I think that's not really object oriented programming. <laughs> so S3 is, um, I'm sorry, summary is S3 function, right? Uh, it's the generic function, yeah. Generic it, it function, takes, I mean. It, 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 takes, it, it, it takes S3 object. Yeah, but it's generic function. Yeah. Mm. So it is part of those 325 generic function, right? Yeah, that was the point one, but I don't know how many summary has, but probably the same amount. And okay. as I said, I don't know if that example, if that's good that this is happening or that it's bad that this is happening, that I get a different summary based on the factor or if it's a numeric. Mm -hmm. It's like I said, it's up to discussion. It, it's it's how R works and it's great. And you can extend it really easily. If you write your own package, you can extend the print function. That's great, but I don't know if it's good. Uh, yeah. I mean, one of the good concepts I think for the OOP, this polymorphism is really good. I mean. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And Brett, did you read that article with from Julia? Yeah, I've <laughs> I, I I've read it a couple times, and I still don't understand it 100. percent Okay. Um, I'm still. Yeah, so it's that's interesting that R actually has the multiple dispatch. When you're showing the example of the of the plus operator, it's clear yeah. that it can dispatch based on either the the left hand side or the right hand side or the first or second parameter. Yeah. 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 Um, so that to me is multiple dispatch. Yeah. So the question is, why does that, you know, why is it considered to be this like wonderful thing in Julia, but people don't really talk about it that much in R? Uh, uh, I, I, you know, that's um, a little beyond yeah. the yeah. scope of R and, learning. But and, and I don't know, I didn't find much about functional OOP except for the John Chambers book. So I don't know if that's a real, really a thing. To call something's function OOP. So it, it could it could be only defined by R and because like it, it's more or less a multiple dispatch. It's nothing more. And the class is simply a signature, in my in my opinion. Maybe I'm wrong, but yeah. Yeah, that's the, this is the first place I've heard I've heard it called that. Um yeah. Yeah, I mean, as far as like, you know, as far as like we we're talking about, as far as a user is concerned, it's, you know, it's a different syntax and it, it hides from the user that you're, that you are doing multiple dispatch because you're not, you're not saying use this method of this object. Yeah. You know, R determines that for you. So yeah, that's, yeah. yeah less, less typing um, and potentially a little you know, a little confusing to a user when, you know, how stuff is being dispatched. Yeah, yeah, it is, it is. Because um, I don't know if you see my, my, um, my screen, I think, yes, you do. Like I said, you, 
it's the multiple dispatch, like I said, with the dot and then the class name. If I now define um, a factor and then I, I call print factor, it will also work. And, and that's, that's the thing. Normally, you simply wouldn't write the other way around. You would write factor.print. And that's also like how, how OOP in my head works. Because, yeah. yeah, and as a, as a you know primarily R user, that's always been confusing to me is that you have to yeah. you have to name a function with the generic before the dot in many languages, which is yeah, yeah. you know now I'm like okay, well what am I working on? Which is like yeah. on one hand it's really good to think about what kind of object you're working on, but it's it's something that you can avoid thinking about in languages like R. Yeah, yeah. So it's great, and I don't want to change it, but. It's difficult when you, yeah, I don't know. But, but like I said, in the next chapter, which is um, the, the next one is I think R6. And R6 is exactly like we would think of object, uh, object oriented programming. <laughs> so every method is inherited in the, mo in the model. So you have all your models, uh, all your methods inside the object defined. <clears throat> and for S4, I, I never used biocontactor packages before, but I would assume it's similar. But yeah, you guys maybe know more about biocontactor packages. And the word biocontactor is big as I know. I mean, I only know it from my girlfriend. She uses a lot of biocontactor, but yeah. Yeah, there are over 2000 software packages in biocontactor. That's big actually. Yeah, it's really big in biology. I mean, I mean I'm doing mostly uh, use of that. That's m m one of the main reasons why, why I joined to the club, like because I really oh. want to understand uh, like um, how these objects are working behind. But yeah, I, I think it's um, uh, and that S6 is um, um, very common in, in some conductor packages. Okay, how, how do you access methods in an S, S6 object? I'm not sure. I mean, I'm, I've just used the functions. I, I don't know the, okay. Um, okay. Okay. the, the engineer behind. Yeah. So um, the bioconductor and are different from the normal CRAN packages, the way packages are written, is that what you're saying? Uh, they are, yeah, but Mariella knows probably more of it. But you cannot install in, install it with the simply install packages. You need to use fire contactor, I mm -hmm. think. Yeah, yeah, you need to first install the um, BioC light, and then uh, from that, um, BioC light has their own installing functions. And um, and those functions uh, and those um, uh, the versions also of Bioconductor are um, sometimes being updated when the versions are are, are updated, but um, but it's uh, also a bit complicated. Like some versions of Bioconductor don't work with certain versions of R and so on. Uh, <laughs> yeah. that, that that's what my girlfriend always runs into it. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Mariela, do you know why, like, um, the the packages from the validity they do have the separate bioconductor? Why not the single like cron? It is in a, anything why that is specific? <laughs> For instance, do you know that? I think it's mostly because the bioconductor is for biological research, bio bio biological analysis. So. Um, <laughs> It's, it, it makes more sense to have the 
like the separate uh, um, world, yeah. more or less. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> right. So I think Mariela, <laughs> I mean, yeah. who sign up for Arsis? Brett, are you or Mariela? Um, I'm I'm R four or S four. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> I say R S. Okay, right. Um, so I think we are done. Yeah, we meet next week. If there is nothing for us to discuss. Okay. And thanks, Anis. Yeah, thanks, Anis. That was great. Thank so, you, Anis. Yeah. So sorry. Uh, <laughs>